voice panel where there's more than one voice actor, it's like you're watching a cartoon unfold. The most bizarre cartoon ever made. It's like suddenly someone does an impression of someone else. Then the other actor has to one-up them by doing another impression. Then the third one might, might mash two or three together. It, I, I feel sorry for all the school teachers when we were kids. It's like, it worked for me, though, because I was quiet. I was shy. And then becoming a voice actor gave me confidence, and now you can't shut me up. No, that's not true. That's true. I'm, I'm still pretty introverted. I'm still pretty quiet. I'm a homebody. Um, and it's like, what do we need to do? I'm like, go to the grocery store. That's it. Okay, cool. Just go home. Netflix, Hulu. Watch lots of things. And then, like, see what's happening in the world and going, that's cool. Check my Twitter. Check my Facebook. And then, you know, play on your phone where it's like, it's the last thing you see before you go up, go to sleep, and then the first thing you see when you wake up. What's the longest someone has gone without picking up their phone? Has anyone, like, taken a vacation from electronics? I hear it's amazing. You, you've done it a week before? Yeah, it's weird. You know, we're all addicted to our phones and technology. That were, they're actually, you, you actually have a little bit of an anxiety attack if you realize you forgot. It's like your wallet or your keys. It's your lifeblood because all your ID and your social media, everything, all those linked, all those passwords, everything, like your bank information, like, oh, it's all on this little thing. Yeah. But yeah, I imagine it's very freeing to uh, put your phone away and just talk to people. Or it's either, or it's intensely awkward. Because now when you go into restaurants, you look around and you see families or friends, the whole table's full of people and they're all on their phones. But maybe someone should be that guy that says, all right, everyone put your phone in this pile and the first person to, to take that phone and use it has to buy everyone's meal. I've heard that works. I wish, I wish they'd have a no cell phone rule at concerts and movies. I, I saw uh, Jack White from White Stripes, a great solo artist, I love him. He had this great notion that people should go to concerts and not sit there and try and obscure the view by taking pictures and videos, just enjoy the experience like people did for decades ago before there were cell phones. So what they had is they paid this third party company to basically have a, a clear or a, or a little Ziploc, not Ziploc, but stronger. They would put your phone in the bag, let you hold on to your phone, but you couldn't access it unless you left the venue, go outside to the gate to a, a tent area, and then they'll, psh, they'll open it up and you can make your call or text or whatever there. Otherwise, you're in the venue, and you gotta just talk to your friends and neighbors and watch the show, and it was freeing, it was so nice. And if you wanted to see photos, just go to his social media thing. He's got photographers that take way better pictures anyway, because they're by the stage. So it's like, that should be a thing. You ever been at a movie and so into it, and then someone is just like on their phone, just texting, it's like, you paid money to watch this, right? Like, anyway, hi. This is a complete stream of consciousness panel. I'm Kyle Abair. I'm a voice actor. I've been doing this for 19 years this year. I started on Dragon Ball Z in 2000. Yes. Yeah. Look at the Z fans in the corner. I love it, baby. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do imitations of the narrator. Next time on Dragon Ball Z, back in 1995. Fast forward to 2001, I'm the narrator. Like, what? Talk about a fanboy dream come true. How cool would it be? Like, you're a fan of something, and suddenly you get to be on it, or in it, or involved in some way. And then like, whoa, this is unreal. This is so cool. And then like, oh my gosh, 
Suddenly, you know, I'm Gohan, and then I'm the narrator, and then I take over as Ox King, and I do a West Kai and PyCon, and like, ah! and then we move on to Yu Yu Hakusho, and then we move, yeah. Yeah, great show. I got to play my first villain on there, Karasu, during the Dark Tournament Saga. Fights Yoko Kurama. Had really long hair and a face mask. He looks like he was in Slipknot or something. <laughs> He's like, why don't you make things easy and submit? And then I ripped myself off by using that same exact voice as Eisen on Bleach. Years later, years later, Pick up and move from Texas, because that's where Funimation still is based today. And now I live in L.A. ever since late 2005, so I've gotten to be a part of Naruto, Bleach, Kiba on Naruto, and uh, Shippuden, and then now Boruto, Kiba shows up occasionally. That's pretty cool. Eyes in through the whole run of Bleach, and Ganju Shiba. He was kind of a dork, but, you know, it's still fun. Uh, Ryu and Street Fighter. That's pretty epic. Uh, he got to be in Wreck-It Ralph, so that was nice. Getting a call from my agent going, Disney wants you. Like, bro, really? Honestly, it's uh, the head of New Generation Pictures that we did the dub for Street Fighter for, and since then. And uh, that was directed by um, Taliesin Jaffe. And the head of that studio is Jonathan Klein. He saw that teaser of Wreck-It Ralph that showed the little Villains Anonymous thing and you see the Street Fighter guys and all that and Zangief and M. Bison are there. He calls up his Disney connection and goes, you know, I have access to the cast if you want. So I guess they took him up on it. That was awesome. So yeah, you see Ryu and Ken, old 8-bit style in the old Street Fighter cabinet at the Litwax Arcade. In the very beginning, sure you can. Whew, what a day. Let's go to Tappers, Ken. It's like, sweet. It's like, yay, I got to be in a Disney movie. I'm still geeking out about that because you, don't you have to be like a movie star? Don't you have to be a celebrity to be in animated movies for some reason? I don't get it. I mean, Disney and Pixar do a good job of, of picking actors who can do voiceover really well. But some of the other studios are just like, you can just play yourself. What an easy payday. Must be nice. You've seen Chris Rock talk about, I walk in the booth and make a million dollars. And like, I wish everyone had it that easy. I mean, that's because you're famous and you got to play yourself. Yeah, I mean, you're great, Chris Rock. You're awesome. Everybody in Madagascar and Shrek and all that, they're, they're wonderful actors and everything. But... It, 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 it's just like, if studios are all about saving money, we're a lot cheaper. And this is kind of what we do. This is our little niche. But if you get guys stay after the movies and watch the credits, sometimes they actually credit the voice people, which is nice. They'll say additional voices. Uh, and you'll, re you'll recognize some people from anime or cartoons in there, like Steve Bloom, Lex Lang, Yuri Lowenthal, Fred Tatashore. I mean, there's, there's so many, so many, and it's awesome. Um, I'm jealous of Lex Lang and Yuri. They've gotten to be on Star Wars like more than once. Like, ah, I could die happy. When people say, what do you want to do? What's your goal in voiceover? It's like, I could die happy just being a stormtrooper just goes, ah! I'm easy. But who knows? There's all these opportunities because Disney is just Star Wars it up, man. There's all these live action TV shows coming out. You got the last of the Skywalker sagas, Rise of the Skywalker coming out this fall, so there's still a chance. See, they do the post-production, they do the effects and the editing and all that stuff, and one of the last things that is done is all the bit part voices. They come in individually or, or come in as a group and they'll come in and voice crowd scenes or one-off characters that aren't named on screen, but on the script they're called like Man A, Demon C, all sorts of stuff. So I've done a little of that. I, I did like a, a version, I did a voice match for the dog, Bayard, in Alice in Wonderland, the sequel, Alice Through the Looking Glass. Didn't get credited though, but I heard me, it's like, oh, they used my take. And then they show Bayard as the flashback with all the animals and the Mad Hatter and all that, and they're younger, and Bayard's a puppy, and it's like, I hear me, that's cool. But I wish I was credited though, that would've been nice.
Everyone just has to take my word for it. Like, sure, you're in that movie. Like, I am. Come on. It, it can't. <laughs> like, me too? Are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, wow, really? Yeah, they have voice matches in those things. Voice matches are where people do impressions of the big movie stars, and they come in and do that little grunt work stuff, the little bit part voices, reactions, short little, <coughs> hey, what's up? Little things. Pat Fraley did all of Buzz Lightyear in the first Toy Story. He did all the, <coughs> you know, all, the, all that stuff. He made 10 grand just to do that. And he got to voice the Buzz Lightyear, the toy. Woody toys are, are, are Tom Hanks' brother. He has a twin brother. So that's a sweet gig. It's like, my brother's a famous actor and I'm just sitting here and it's like, you want to voice my toy? Like, oh, okay. You know, and all that. I mean, back in the day when the DBZ first had the talking toys with the power-up buttons and all that, they, used, they had a voice chip in there, so they have our voices. I still have the toys and you still push the button, but I don't want to push it too much because I want to leave it in the package and I don't want to have to try and replace the battery. But I'm on there and people think, oh, you made good money on that, right? And it's like, no. Didn't make a dime. But it's still cool, right? It's still like, hey, I got to be a toy. I got to be an action figure. And now everyone wants to be a Pop Funko figure. Because it's like, they have Gohan, but it's Kid Gohan. It's not the one that I voiced. It's the same character, granted. But it's like, come on. You have 50,000 different Gokus and Vegetas and Piccolos and all that stuff. Can we get a grown-up Gohan? I'll take the tracksuit Gohan even at this point. Come on, just... I know some people like the tracksuit. It's like, but come on, great Saiyan man. He'd be the perfect thing for a Pop Funko with the, with the cool helmet and all that stuff. So write Pop Funko. You'd buy it. You'd buy it. We have one sale. It would make one sale. <laughs> one person would buy it. So therefore, I think it's a good idea. I mean, they have Pop Funkos for everything. Even movie directors. J.J. Abrams, what? I mean, I understand you're a fan of a movie director, but do you really want, like, random guy sitting on your, you know, I don't know. But, like, all the Gohan has been, like, super, like, canon, like, very recently. Like, you can, like, the film that you like, all the old movies, like, those were canon, as if they were a record, so you might see part of the That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Like, as, as, as we go down, hopefully from here on out, if they make a new, like, a super part two or whatever, if they make another series or make another movie, I really hope Toye and Akira Toriyama remember Gohan because he wasn't even in the Broly movie at all. It's like, where was he? Where'd he go? He's studying. I mean, he's a responsible parent and we'll give him kudos on that because Goku sure wasn't. Piccolo is Gohan's dad, I admit that. It's just when you get down to it. I mean, Gohan might as well take some green paint and... Hey, Mr. Piccolo. Yeah. What's that? Uncanny. Yes. Resemblance is totally uncanny. I was wondering if PyCon in the other world tournament, I wonder if he was like a Namek because he kind of looked the same, but you don't really find out much about him. He had a fun moment in the Fusion Reborn movie where he's yelling at trash. <laughs> But yeah, I, I have no inside knowledge. I don't know where Dragon Ball is going to go from this point other than I really doubt it's going away. It is crazy, stupid, popular now. I would argue probably even more popular now because it was the, the big thing in the late 90s, early 2000s. Then it went away and then that generation grew up and then it's all about nostalgia now. So we had those movies that kind of tested the water, right? You know? Battle of Gods and then Resurrection F, they were huge hits in Japan and around the world in English. And it's like, all right, sweet. This thing is like never going away. It is literally what has given me a, a job, a career, which is what I wanted anyway. I wanted to, to voice for, for cartoons and I've done a little of that, but I've mostly made a career out of doing anime dubs and video games. And it's so much fun, but it is a technical skill. It's very much a technical skill to sit there and act and do the lip sync thing 
and you know, there's no study or there's no rehearsal or anything. You don't get the footage or the script ahead of time. So you have, you have to be good at cold reading. You have to be good at improv because occasionally you got to do something to help lift that dialogue off the page and make it sound natural. Um, so we always tell people who want to do voice acting, it's not about doing the crazy amount of cartoon voices. It really is about being a good actor first and foremost. Everything else is bonus. Because you got all the crazy, amazing cartoon people. If they want to get like Jim Cummings or something, for example, then they'll just get Jim Cummings. But if you bring something to the table that's completely different and unique to you, that's your advantage over everyone else. So that's what you learn by taking acting classes and working with acting coaches. Save your money. Believe me, it's an investment in your craft, just like lawyers go to law school. Doctors go to med school. Actors, you don't have to get an acting degree, by the way. You only get a degree in something like that if you want to teach. I mean, totally. But other than that, you want to move to the LA area where, where most of that work is. Cartoons, video games, anime dubs. Not as many as in Texas, but I think Hollywood offers way more, a way more wider scope of projects, commercials. Commercials are very profitable. They're not as fun as being characters, but it's awesome. It's awesome to, uh, I opened my mind and, and I was just like amazed to see how this, this whole world of voiceover really works. So now I'm auditioning for all sorts of projects. I'm, I, I do narration for uh, corporate training videos or basically online you know, things. I'm teaching technical skills for French people who speak English as a second language. So I have to act like I know what I'm talking about. I have no, I have no clue what I've been narrating. All these parts and things, I guess they're part of machinery and industrial thing. I don't know, but I sound like I do. That's where the acting comes in. And I get to record it from home. Today, technology has come a great long way to where it's, it's more economical, it's more cheaper. It's, it's more cheaper. It's cheaper. It, it is more affordable to be able to record at home with something as simple as a plug-and-play mic, a USB mic that goes straight into your device. I've even had, I even have something called an Apogee, that's the company, Apogee, makes something called the Apogee mic. It has a plug-in just for iPhones and iDevices, a lightning connector. I can go right into my iPhone, record auditions. They sound great. They're professional. I did them here this weekend in the hotel. What you do is make a pillow for it. Throw the comforter over your head, turn the AC off. You look like an idiot. But it deadens the, the sound in the room where it's not echoing off the walls like it does in here. It's like very silent, very quiet, and that's what you need. My recording setup at home is my walk-in closet. Lots of sound absorption in there. Yeah, I've got some acoustic foam and everything. But for the most part, it's the clothing and the boxes and the quilts and the blankets and all that stuff that absorbs sound. The minute you take that out of there, you know when you walk into a house or an apartment and your voice sounds like this in every room? It's because there's nothing in the room to absorb sound. Your furniture does that. So um, yeah, as long as you don't have loud neighbors, and I do, they, they stomp and practice drums and ukulele and all sorts of fun stuff. Luckily, I can't hear it from the closet. I wonder if they hear me, though, because it's really, it's got to be disconcerting when I have to audition for something like Call of Duty, for example, and the audition lines are like, incoming! You're going to die! Ah! You know, they must think they've got a PTSD soldier downstairs, you know, or a serial killer or something like that. I almost wish I could put a recording neon sign or something that lit up everywhere. So that's like, don't call the cops or the cops are knocking on the door. It's like, we got a noise complaint. Are you killing someone in here? I'm just a voice actor. Don't mind me. Like, yeah, yeah, right. You're a voice actor. Perfect cover. Watch him make a movie one day about like someone who just totally gets away with murder. And he's a voice actor. Or he says he's a voice actor. It's like, no, no, no. That's just an audition. It could happen. I don't know. Maybe I'll write that screenplay. Yeah. You'd watch it? 
So now we have one, one viewer of my story and one purchase of the great Sam and Pop Funko figure. All right, this is good. This is good. Yay! You have a question? Yes. What about the JoJo book? Oh, yeah, luckily, I think I wasn't living in that particular apartment when I tried out. Um, when I auditioned for Kakyoin, it was just like some of the first lines in the show. We did like test episodes. And then fast forward a couple years later, they went ahead and greenlit it because they let the, the, the public watch it. And the fans were like, yes, we want to see a Stardust Crusaders dub. And we finally got that. I get to that episode and Tony Oliver is the director. He directed Gurren Lagann as well. And great, great, great guy. Awesome voice actor in his own right. And uh, he says, so in this scene, he's possessed and he's licking cherries. And it's just suggestive looking. And it's like, yeah, I watched it in Japanese. You know, is that what I'm doing? It's like, no, in English, it's going to be lick, 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 lick. Okay, it's the first time I've seen something as a meme first, and then I do the English thing. I mean, I go from watching it in meme form to a YouTube clip, and now there's me, so you could, you could look it up on YouTube. You can see it in Japanese or English. It, it, either way, it's, it's crazy disturbing. Ooh. Yeah, um, I don't know my neighbors. I'm too busy being annoyed by all the noise they make. So it's not like I'm gonna go upstairs and say, hi, I, I live downstairs, pay no attention to the screams. Because even that sounds like a cover, right? It sounds like, yeah, sure, buddy. We're gonna have people come by and the night security guard. It's like, well, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't rat on them because they could rat on me. But honestly, my workaround, when I have to do shouty, screamy, gut-ripping, vocal cord shredding auditions, I'll take my Apogee mic and my iPhone or iPad and go to my car in the parking garage. <laughs> Granted, yeah, I look around, make sure no one's in the parking garage, because, yeah, even in the car, you're going to hear something. But if you're in a car, don't turn it on, no AC. Yes, it gets stuffy and hot real quick, but that is a dead space. The sound is just as quiet as a studio. So yeah, I've done that. I remember auditioning for Attack on Titan and everyone had the same audition lines like, no, I'll kill you. You know, I had to scream at the top of my lungs. I was so embarrassed. Luckily, I got out of the car, no one was around. I halfway expect that though. I'm gonna get out of the car, it's like, See some wide-eyed neighbor going, you okay? Like, yeah, I'm fine. See, audition, see a voiceover person. You could do that. You could totally do that. Yeah. That'd be fun. I could say, officer, let me, just, just follow me to Bang Zoom Studios and uh, we'll hop in the booth. I'll show you what we're talking about. It's like, what are you working on? A uh, very violent show. <laughs> like, oh, okay. And like some people ask, it's like, has being the voice of something like Dragon Ball Z or something gotten you any sort of advantages before? It's like, yeah, I can't think of any... Like, yeah, hey, get, get front row at a concert or something. Like, no, that doesn't happen. I get like a free scoop of ice cream, maybe. If someone recognizes me, I don't pull the, do you know who I am? Th I don't do that. <laughs> but if someone recognizes me, and it does happen from time to time, usually it's someone who saw me at a con. It's not total anonymity. Although one time it was disturbing. I was with a friend, another voice actor, actually. His name's Ed Bosco. He's on Street Fighter as well. Forgot his who. Anyway. We're at IHOP, we have a meal, we get up to leave, the people sitting in the booth behind us go, excuse me, are you Kyle Bear?" And I go, yeah. 
It's like, oh, I thought that was you. It's like, oh, did, did you see me at Anime Expo or something? It's like, no, I just recognized you from your voice. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, all right then. I mean, I figure something like Steve Bloom, you know, with a low, raspy, velvety tone, you know, Toonami Tom, Spike from Cowboy Bebop, Wolverine, you know. Someone like that, you would hear and instantly know, oh, I know that voice. Even if you couldn't remember the name, you'd be like, I know that guy. Me? What? It's crazy. I didn't change my name for, for being an actor or anything. So my real name is A Bear. Like, A Bear is attacking me. Uh, the H is silent, the E's like an A. A Bear is a Louisiana French name, so that's about the only place in America where they get my name right. Everywhere else, I'm Kyle Herbert or Kyle Hebert. I bet 99% of you are going, that's what I thought it was. <laughs> uh, that's okay, but usually I have to use some sort of, you know, like, are you a football fan? There was Bobby A. Bear, no relation. It's like, oh yeah, okay. Stephen Colbert. Spelt like Colbert, but people say Colbert. The Colbert Rapport. Like, oh yeah, cool, all right. So yeah, Kyle A. Bear. I didn't change my name. I probably should have, because then people would remember it. And like, Kyle Smith. They would spell it right. They would never misspell Smith. Uh, I just wanted to do my family proud, even though no one in my family, I'm the only one who has any ties to the entertainment industry. I'm like, okay. Everyone else was like corporate day job types. And that, that's an interesting conversation. I mean, if you're lucky enough to be blessed with a family or parents or whoever, your guardians that support what you want to do with your life, that's great. And I was blessed that way. My parents are like, whatever you want to do that makes you happy, son, we support you. And like, that meant the world. That was amazing. Um, but I know there's people out there that don't have that. People that, you know, question your sanity. My, my folks kind of did that. It's like, wouldn't you rather just have a day job? They're like, no, I really, I don't, no, no. I enjoy the freedom. I'm self-employed, which means I pay more taxes and I'm way more stressed because I don't have guaranteed hours like someone with a real job. I don't have guaranteed health insurance. I, there, there's a lot of things you, you, you give up to pursue this sort of thing. And we audition more than we actually work. I, I would hasten to guess even the most seasoned actors that are signing autographs at this convention will probably agree with me that even though they're super duper experienced and they've got that resume that they do, none of us know where the next paycheck's coming from. You know, we're hired and essentially fired. You know, once we're done recording, that's it. On to the next one. We show up for the session, record, sign some papers, go home. Paycheck shows up in the mail like a month later, sometimes a couple weeks. That's nice. Once in a blue moon, you might even have someone who pays you at the end of the session. That hardly ever happens. So yeah, you have to have a thick skin. We are used to being told in the form of, uh, told no in the form of we never hear from them. We audition, send it off, or audition in a studio, and then never hear back. It's like, all right, that one wasn't meant to be. Okay. So you can't sit there and second guess, like, I would have, could have, should have done this on the audition. You'll just drive yourself crazy. Just do the best you can. Have fun. Pretend it was the job. See, think of the audition as the job. Like, what do you do for a living? Like, I audition. I mean... It's more fun to just say, I'm a voice actor guy. But what I technically do, what's your job description? I audition. Occasionally I get paid to let the voices out of my head. Most of the time they come out for free. <laughs> they have to call a priest or something. But uh, yeah, you know, you're used to being told no. You don't know where the next paycheck's coming from. Uh, the cost of living, of course, is atrocious. You live in California. I don't know how the market is in Sacramento, but LA is like, woo, expensive. Uh, it's even worse in Vancouver, I hear. I feel sorry for the Canadians. They're like paying way more. Um, golly. Plus, you got to think about what your goals are. It's like, okay, I want to voice anime 
So that means you've got to be in a city where they record anime, first of all. That's your first hurdle. Second of all, voiceover is a very competitive field. Um, it's harder on the ladies because there's less work. It's sad, but true. So therefore, because if there's less work, it's more competitive. Um, and, you know, you just got to just take these reality checks in stride and going, all right, so that's the lay of the land I'm facing up against, right? Because, you know, you got people that do this job until they can't anymore because it's so fun and so great and so gratifying from a soul level, if not financial, um, that they'll do it till they die or they do it till they retire or, or move to go pursue something else. So that's why you tend to hear a lot of the same actors for many, many years in shows and games. I still work with people that have been doing it way longer than me. Richard Epcar, Kirk Thornton, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, you've heard these guys for decades. And they're still doing it. Tony Oliver, still doing it. His first role was on Robotech in the 80s. And I know a lot of you probably don't know that show, but your parents do, if they know anything about anime anyway. Back in the 80s, all that stuff, anime wasn't even a word. They called it Japanimation. Doesn't that sound vaguely racist? I just called it cartoons as a kid. I grew up in the 70s, so it's like Speed Racer. It's just a cartoon to me. And then people that get offended if you call anime cartoons, it's like, what is anime? It's cartoons from Japan. It's like, well, then why would you be offended? It's animation. Animation. It's not a bad word to be uh, associated and call, say, cartoon. Because a cartoon, just like in Japan, especially nowadays, is not necessarily for kids. Uh, what is it? Love, Death and Robots or something? That Netflix animated anthology for adults. It's got CG, it's got 2D animation, 3D animation for the grown-ups to watch. So it's like, cool, they, they service every market, just like anime does. Everything from Pokemon to disturbing tentacle things. There's a market for everything. Yes. Um, I'm not sure about the level of work. I mean, obviously on a lot of anime, it may be an all-girl cast and all that. Here's the only problem. Anime pays so poorly. On average, it's anywhere from like $65 to $75 an hour with what's called a two-hour minimum, so at least you make that 120 and some change or whatever, before taxes and all that stuff. Video games and cartoons roughly make $200 an hour, and it's easier to do. It's so weird. It's always had this stigma that dubbing voices, which is what happens in every live-action TV show and movie you've ever seen, there are scenes that are dubbed over because, you know, there's planes going over, a cell phone goes off, a car's honking their horn, and you can tell if you really listen with your ear, certain things sound dubbed. They are. Sometimes not even by those actors that you're looking at. So, yeah, that just has always been an industry standard that has just been treated like a red-haired stepchild. It's like, ah, it's just dubbing. Oh, it's just, nah. But people don't understand. And hopefully in 2019, there's a push now that social media is a thing. We can make people aware and appreciate the effort that goes into it, especially for dub haters, people that just don't, that just hate it because it's in English. It's like, guys, come on. There's so many better, appropriate things to be angry about in this world. An anime being in English is not one of them. Or bullying your friends or someone else for, for the, the way they want to watch anime. It's like, come on. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I hate haters. I hate haters. You know, go away, haters. I saw a clever, uh, <laughs> clever t-shirt years ago. It's like, if I wanted to read anime, I'd buy manga. Like, oh, fair. Okay. That's all right. My problem is not that it's, oh, uh, you know, I don't think the actor's better or anything. When I watch something subtitled, I'm trying to read and I might miss something that happens on screen. 
Not a problem in an action movie or a horror movie, really, but something that's dialogue intensive. You might have to pause and rewind and all that stuff. I totally get that. Absolutely respect that. So nothing but love for everyone in whatever preferred way they want. If they hate English dubs, hopefully it's for a, constru a constructive reason it's like, or just a matter of preference and just leave it at that. Because I know that if that person created something and the world has the potential to see that, that show or play that game or whatever in their native language, you're going to totally approve that. Why? Because it's a business. It will make you money. Anime and manga, it's a business. It is a wonderful, amazing cultural art form. But at the end of the day, those are artists and creators that deserve to be paid. Those are studios. It costs money to create these things. So that's why uh, people speak very strongly against pirating and torrenting and, you know, all the legal means you have to obtain anime and manga now with all these official releases and all these great streaming services that are licensing things left and right. It's like the best time to be a fan and, and feel, feel good that you're giving back to them by paying your monthly streaming fee or whatever or your Crunchyroll monthly membership or Funimation or whatever it is. I mean, even if you're sitting there watching a free membership and, and tolerating all those ads, those ads pay for the show you're watching, as annoying as it is, whether it's a movie, a show, or whatever, all those commercials, everything, it all comes down to the, the money that, that is invested in the system that comes back out so they can make more, you know, the circle of life. We love that. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, was all of that improv was a bit scripted? And how that? Yeah, when I was Nostalgia Critic, Doug Walker, we had a script, uh, we had a, a, a skit that he had an idea for. We're both at MatsuriCon in Ohio. And he, uh, he says, you know how fans come up to you and say, do the voice? I go, yeah. It's like, so I want to do this skit where I say, hey, Kyle, the narrator from Dragon Ball Z, hey, do the voice. So I'm like, next time on Dragon Ball Z. They go, thanks, that's awesome. And then I just keep talking as the narrator. And then I follow him. I'm stalking him. And he's like, can't get away. He's screaming at me, calling me names. I crash his panel. He finally has to like smother me with a pillow. I pop up in his hotel room in bed. It's like, oh my God, yeah. And then I'm like, next time on Dragon Ball, no, no, you know. So seek it out. Kyle Abair is an a-hole. That's the name of the video. Have I narrated people? Um, no. What, does it pay? <laughs> when people say, would you narrate my life? It's like, let's see, um, give me like a dollar a day. How many years you're going to live? A hundred? Oh, yeah. Maybe I should up my rate. I don't know. And then Johnny brushed his teeth and then flushed the toilet. Yeah, I could do that. People say, like, what's the line you remember or like doing the most? It's next time on Dragon Ball Z. Why? Because it fits everything. You know, a show ends, next time on Dragon Ball Z. You know, whatever it is. It's like, it fits everything. So, yeah. People dare me to go through the drive through McDonald's or something, and order as the narrator. I haven't done it yet. Maybe one day. Maybe I'll film it and put it on YouTube or something. I'd like a Super Saiyan size quarter pounder with cheese. My luck, it'll be the one guy who doesn't know anything about anime. It's like, thanks, pull through, smart guy. I'm like, yes. Uh, so with how inconsistent voice acting work can be, do you have a side hustle? My side hustle, uh, let's see. No, not really. I mean, I do, I just, I am very lucky to just make my living doing voiceover. For the longest time, when I first moved to L.A., I was a producer, a.k.a. I ran the board for a talk show about addiction recovery, and I would do edits at home and audio editing and mastering of, of, of just the talk show stuff that was like internet radio talk shows. 
Uh, then eventually I started going to, to more cons and uh, more and getting hired by more studios. So luckily that's where I'm at. A lot of people, the side hustles are Uber, Lyft, Starbucks. There's no shame in any of it. I mean, you got bills to pay. The, they're not going to wait. So if you're starting out, or even in the first few years of your career, chances are you're going to have to keep your day job. At what point do you feel comfortable in letting it go and just trying to say, I'm just going to live on voiceover? That's a, that's a scary thing, and it's deeply personal. It's like, have you stashed enough money away in your savings to kind of float for a while so it's not the end of the world if no one calls? Or have you been networking so you meet enough people to hopefully be on their radar so that you have audition opportunities? You got to keep doing that. Even if you have an agent, I still get most of the, my work, not through my agent, but through my industry contacts that I've worked with through the years over and over again, the studios. So it's very important to forge relationships with other people. And it's hard to be that guy, you know, especially if you're really like introverted and kind of shy and you're, you don't want to leave the wrong impression because you don't want to be too pushy and too obvious about it. You want to be humble. You want to be a nice person and meet other people because these people in voiceover, they're some of the nicest, coolest, most laid back people you'll ever want to meet. They will have your back. Because if they're not right for a part, they may recommend you for the part. They're willing to sacrifice a gig or an audition because, hey, that's my cool buddy, man. You know, I'm going to throw them in the audition. I'll tell the director. It's like, hey, I know someone who would be great for this part. This happens all the time. So networking is huge. Okay, so kind of a two-part question um, uh, uh, that's not even related. First off, do you ever miss Radio Disney? I miss Radio Disney. That was my, that was the full-time job that I walked away from to become a voiceover actor. Absolutely, I totally miss it. Because I used to be a DJ. My name was Squeege. Like a squeegee. And, uh, you know, my, my show is, you know, it would totally like Robin Williams meets Jim Carrey. So I'd be like, yes, this is Britney Spears, followed by the Backstreet Boys, coming up, bang, media, and I'd just go into like, I was possessed by all these weird voices. That was so much fun. I totally miss it. Yeah, I was. I lived down in LA at the time, and I listened to your show. Um, oh, cool! Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all, second is, what uh, have you auditioned for that you really wish you got, and really wish you voiced, but just didn't get didn't get a shot at it? Yeah, uh, everything that I wish that I could have been hired for and I read for, and it just didn't happen. Uh, everything I haven't been cast on. It's like. I wish I was hired on everything. That's not realistic, of course. But, you know, if I've gotten to read for Star Wars, Rebels, and, golly, Gears of War, uh, all the big games. I mean, I found out after the fact, because they were so secretive, I'm in bit part voices in Red Dead Redemption 2. I have no memory of recording for it. First world problem. It's like, you just record all the time, Kyle. Poor thing. You know, like, no, I really don't remember. They didn't tell me. I would have remembered Red Dead Redemption. That's kind of a huge thing. Um, uh, other things, golly, I've, I've read for all the Batman Arkham games. That would have been nice. But I can't take away, I can't, I can't be Kevin Conroy. I can't be Mark Hamill. And strangely enough, those roles were up for casting. They, were, they had them in the audition sides. It's like, I don't want to read for Batman. I mean, I want to read for Batman, but it's like, I, there's no way, no way. So it's like, it's always a money issue, right? It's like, you guys, you can totally afford this. It's worth it. The fans deserve it. You don't go and change it up now. So yeah, anything like that. All the whole Marvel universe and all that. Hi, Ash. Ash is my helper here. He's standing by the microphone where you guys can come up and ask a question and the whole room can hear. Yeah, I, I was, I was going to say that, yeah. You okay. Do you want to come ask a question? So you can be like heard. Yeah. Can you t maybe take the mic out of the stand and then hand it to him? Yeah, thank you. Which character do you like the voice the most? Oh, I like the voice the most is actually Ox King on Dragon Ball Z. Oh boy, Chi Chi's getting married. Because uh. I love wrestling too. <coughs> and Ox King sounds like Macho Man, Randy Savage. Oh yeah. 
So I love doing Ox King. He's just a silly, silly, goofy guy. And I crack the directors up and the engineer every time that I have to do a line. So that's fun. I mean, I love being Great Saiyan Man, too. Like, guardian of the city, I am the Great Saiyan Man. Nailed it, you know. I love that, too. Cool, thank you. So yeah, if anybody has a question, just come up here, make a line in front of this mic stand right here. Yay! So do you sometimes record um, audio? You said you, said you didn't uh, recall recording for Red Dead Redemption. So do you sometimes record um, lines without the knowledge of what it's going into? Yeah, there are some projects that either don't have a name or they don't, or they're being just that secretive. We'll sign a non-disclosure agreement that's confidentiality. That means I can't talk about it, tweet about it, or anything. Can't take a picture in the booth or anything. They get really, really skittish about that sort of thing. Once in a while, a client's really cool and says, totally, totally tweet this. It's like, you're working on Blue Exorcist. Take a picture with Bond in the background or whatever. Yeah, that rarely happens, though. Usually you have to wait for the game or the show to come out. Then I can start, you know, it's like, oh, it came out today or it's on Netflix today. Now I can say, oh, yes, I'm Pride, Escanor on Seven Deadly Sins. And it just happens that way. We usually have to sit on it for months. And it's hard, especially with games. I had to sit on being Ryu in Street Fighter 4 for a year. It takes a long time, even when you're adapting a game from Japan, because it's not even done there yet. So we just have the Japanese audio tracks. We don't even have the visual cues of the cutscenes or anything. So if you play Street Fighter 4 or 5 and notice that the lip syncs off, that's the reason. We didn't have any visuals to go by. Happens a lot. Same with Fighter Z, the Dragon Ball game. It's like we have no clue. All I see in the booth is an Excel spreadsheet with the script on it. We, every line has a number. We go in the order and we do all the fight sounds at the end. Because all that, all that stuff can blow your voice out if you're not careful. Ten minutes? Got ten minutes. Yeah, come on up. Let's hear your question. Pika, pika. Which do you like better, Ballistamon, Dorulamon, or Professor Oak? Okay, Ballistamon, Dorulamon, or Professor Oak. Okay, so I got to voice Professor Oak in Pokemon Origins. That's on uh, Pokemon.com. And uh, that's just a couple of episodes, but golly, yeah, I was super stoked to get to voice Professor Oak. Man, that's a, that's a big character. Are you a boy or a girl? I mean, he's like a younger version of him. Um, so that's really neat. But getting to be two Digimon in the same show, Ballistamon and Darulamon. And uh, which one was that? Digimon Fusion. What? Yeah. That was so much fun. We got to improvise a lot of the lines in that. Like... Um, I don't remember an example of it, but I did get to kind of uh, take it in my own direction with um, Ballistamon. I made his voice sort of similar to, remember the actor Phil Hartman from Saturday Night Live many, many years ago. It was also on The Simpsons and all that. He passed away, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I kind of channeled my impression of him into that, into that character and... Um, Darulamon, this tiger looking with a, thing, with a drill on his tail that reminds me of Kamina. Um, his voice is a lot like Ryu in Street Fighter. So it's like, I can be Ryu and just no one really knows it but me. And yeah, I totally geek out getting to, to see toys of the characters I get to be. So I went to Target. I found little versions of my Digimon. And it's like, I'm totally buying these. Found my reuse and all the variant Pop Funko figures, and I have all the DBZ stuff from back in the day. Love collecting that stuff. There's stuff, and there's there's stuff in shows that I wish had more merchandise and was still around. Um, I forgot the name of the show, but it was really funny. Oh well, blank show, <laughs> blank game. I wish they had, you know would make a toy of my character. Like, how come there's not an eyes in action figure? I mean, there's bleach figures for Ichigo, everybody else. I've seen a couple eyes in like statuesque sort of things, but they don't make a plushie of him. They don't make a like, it's like, you know you made it when they make a plushie of your character, a little chibi plushie. Chibi, chibi, they're so cute. They're just so adorable. Come on up. 
Hi. Also, I just want to say you're amazing. Um, Thank if you. If they bring Bleach back, would you do Eisen? Totally. It's just a matter of will they do it? And if they do it, will it be licensed? And if it's licensed, will they be smart and bring the same actors back? Um, I mean, there's many reasons that could come about why a, a voice gets recast. But all I know is I'm available, I'm willing to do it if the opportunity comes. But I have no say. I, can, I would love to call Viz and go, hey, you should finish Bleach. <laughs> Just like I, I call Akira Toriyama, hey, let Gohan have his day. You know, let him be the focus of the next DBZ movie, you know. I'd watch it. I'd watch it, okay. <laughs> Indeed. Hi. Hey there. Uh, so there's lots of places to find like commercial voiceover gigs, like a lot of the pay-to-play sites. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering where you find casting call for more character work. Casting calls for more character work. Uh, there's a lot of indie animators and stuff. I would probably do my search on YouTube, Newgrounds, Google, Google search for message boards for indie developers for games and and flash animated tunes. I think that's because the internet's here to stay, YouTube's here to stay. This is where I think tomorrow's big star, oh, I mean, there's plenty of big YouTube celebs now, but, you know, to be the next Seth MacFarlane, I mean, who's to say you couldn't just create your own thing, build a team of animators and voice your own characters? <laughs> and then the right eyes at some studio happen to be watching clips on YouTube and they come across yours. So... Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Good luck with that, yes. Hi. Hi. Can you recall like any of your most like surprising or difficult roles to play? Surprising or difficult roles to play? Um, I haven't found difficulty in voicing them. The only difficulty can be from a physical standpoint of when I scream too much on a game or show and I start losing my voice. You start getting real self-conscious, and I mean, yeah, the studios are cool, they get that. You're a human, you're gonna break down, you gotta heal. So yeah, they may cut the session short, you just come back another day and finish up again. So yeah, I've done that, where it's just been, I've been like a random soldier, but all my dialogue is battlefield-oriented. It's all shouting from the top of my lungs, and when you're recording games, for example, they want three takes of everything. An A, B, and C take of like, incoming, incoming, incoming. You know, you're just like, oh. you're tired. It's like, and finally at the end of two hours, now your death screams. I'm like, <laughs> I had a director hand me a lozenge at the beginning of the session. This was Carl Weathers who plays Apollo Creed in the original Rocky movies. You know, the movie Creed, that's about his son, but the actor Carl Weathers played Apollo Creed in the old Rocky movies, and uh, great actor. He's going to be in the new Star Wars uh, Mandalorian TV series. Great actor, and he's directed video games, believe it or not. So uh, Red Faction, uh, Red Faction Armageddon. I played a soldier on that. I've been on Titanfall, the first Titanfall. Just background voices that you barely hear me. Like once every 10 minutes I hear, it's like, that was me, uh, that was me. But to record for it, uh, 12 to 16 hours of nothing but, but yelling. Not in a row. I mean, they, they book it like four hours at a time max. And they, they would space it out. Like, come back this week, next week, come back on a Monday, the Monday after, or whatnot. Uh, but now, a lot of actors are banding together going, hey, this is our livelihood. If we lose our voice, then we can't work. So how about we shave a couple hours off of that and we say, okay, if you're going to do nothing but scream, the max should be two hours, not four. It's like, work with us here. And a lot of the companies you guys have may have seen on social media where it's like there was a, a voice actor strike in the union where a lot of major studios, Disney, Warner Brothers, Sony, and all that were like, ah, you're all replaceable, you're expendable, anybody could do that. It's like, really? Wow, okay. But finally, with enough influence and hashtag movement and, and all that, the people that, that show that, hey, it matters. I want these voice actors doing it. I don't want you know, them to lose their voice. I don't want to see them always cat, you know, thrown to the side while you spend millions to get 
whatever A-list celebrity to be a voice in a game for 10 seconds. I mean, what do they get Patrick Stewart for, for a few hundred thousand dollars in, in Elder Scrolls? Skyrim for a second, you know, just a little narration, then he goes home and then they're gonna, everyone has to penny pinch, it's like, oh gosh. You know, your, your day session for a voice actor is about, you know, eight or nine hundred dollars or so. That's nothing. If you're willing, if you're a company with the money to pay a, 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 you know, someone that much money and then treat your actors like, oh, I'm doing you a favor by casting you. You should like, oh, come on, not cool. I have one minute? Okay, lightning round, come on in. We're gonna get your questions. So what did you learn from voice acting? What did I learn? Yeah. <laughs> what did I learn from voice acting? I learned my ability to uh, do public speaking to build my confidence, uh, to learn an appreciation for the art that I learned myself, that it's not just about doing voices, it really is about acting and, and doing that. I mean, it's one thing to be a fan, but that doesn't mean you're cut out to be an actor. But I always encourage everyone who's interested in doing that to take classes and take steps to see if that's really for them, if they have the natural talent, if they have the patience and the determination and they, they save their money to invest in the classes and take the time, then yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's kind of what I learned. I also learned that it's more fun than I ever imagined it could be. So I'm gonna do this till I can't do it anymore. Thank you. All right. Last one. What was your reaction when Re was announced as DLC in Super Smash Brothers? Oh man, man, you couldn't pick my jaw off the floor fast enough. When I said, oh man, I get to be in Super Smash Brothers? What? So they got Ryu. I go to the session to record. It took me like 20 minutes to record. Nothing, right? And he's like, so this is Smash. Sure you can! You know, like short stuff. But like, again, three takes of each line. But I get there and they're all geeking out. It's like, oh my God, we got Ryu here. It's like, and I'm geeking out because the Nintendo guys are geeking out over me being there. Just like Disney was freaking out over, like Ryu's here. It's like, I'm at Disney. Ah! And then, like the icing on the cake is that DLC for Super Smash Brothers came out on my birthday, June 14th. Came out, not by design, it just happened to come out that day. When Nintendo made the announcement at E3, it became downloadable that day for everyone with a 3DS at the time and all that. And it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Sweet. Happy early birthday. Thank you, thank you. Turning half a century on the 14th. I'm not old, I'm vintage. Anyway, boys and girls, I'm so sorry. It's time. We got we to gotta pull the plug. Got to go. But thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed SAC Anime. This is an awesome con. And I hope to see you in the future. All right? Peace. Love. Happiness. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs>